you know, there are so many people that I know, younger guys, my age, they get into real estate, they make six figures in, in a year, and they go out and buy this luxury car. You've got to now pay to maintain that thing. And instead of, you know, having a piece of real estate that starts adding into that monthly passive income and appreciating to a point where, you know, in five years, I mean, really, I could take off right now and be gone for the next three months, and I'm fine. I don't have to worry about a thing. My team's going to keep running. I'm going to keep making money. We're good. But instead of investing for that so that that amount of money is so much to where you can really just not worry about anything, you're buying a sports car. You're trying to impress other people. Like I, To me, flexibility in my life is paramount to impressing people that I don't even care about. Yeah. You know, so again, at some point I will buy that Ferrari for myself, but right now I'm building and laying the foundation. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to The Root of All Success. I'm The Real Jason Duncan. I've got a great guest for you today. We're here at The Standard at the Smith House in Nashville, Tennessee. We're actually recording in the Rhino Room. If you don't watch this on YouTube, you've got to go make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash The Real Jason Duncan, and you can see all the video content that I produce on a pretty regular basis, including the playlist for the podcast, The Root of All Success, so you can get to see this. So thankful, we're thankful to be syndicated on the C-Suite Radio Network, so we're on every podcast player. So thanks to them, you get to hear it wherever you are. If you're driving in your car, you're working out, you're out working in the yard, thanks to the C-Suite Radio Network, we've actually got this out there for you. So make sure you subscribe, leave a comment and a review. We love five-star reviews. It helps to get us in front of more people so that I could talk to more interesting and successful entrepreneurs like we're going to talk with Tyler Cobble today. So thank you for, for listening. It really, really does mean a lot to me that you spend time listening to the show on a regular basis. And I also want to thank uh, Josh Smith, the proprietor and owner of The Standard at the Smith House here in Nashville, Tennessee, for letting us use this facility as our recording studio. And it's been a fantastic place to record. I don't do all of them live. A lot of, this is a lot of my shows are by Zoom and some are on location. But uh, when I'm here in Nashville and I can get a Nashville guest to come in or for even flying from out of town, you know, I've had guests flying from New York and Dallas and California, and, and it's just cool to have people come in and get to experience the standard of the Smith House. So let me introduce today's guest as we get into this. So this is Tyler Cobble. So Tyler and I met uh, through a local real estate investors network here in the Nashville market. And I was really impressed with this guy. He started his first, he started a boutique, uh, working for a boutique um, uh, real estate development company in a commercial space when he was just 21 years old. And uh, he was able to, before he turned 25, sell $12 million in commercial real estate. That's a lot, that's a lot. It's a, certainly, that's a, a small, small piece of what he's done since then. But the average age of a commercial real estate broker is 54 years old. And so Tyler is a millennial and he was becoming increasingly frustrated with the inflexibility, the lack of innovation, resistance to new, new technology. So he went on and started the Cobble Group, which is his own commercial real estate investment and brokerage company. And uh, he has sold, I think the number is like $68 million in real estate now. And in the first four months of 2021, when we're, this is the year we're recording the show, he sold more this, these four months, those four months, than he did the first two years after the company was started. He's got a team of 11, they're killing it. He, his, one of his things, he wants to keep East Nashville weird and growing and fun. And, and uh, he's right here, he is a Nashvillian, and I think you're gonna really enjoy learning about him. He's got a book, it's an Amazon best-selling book called Open for Business, The Insider's Guide to 
uh, leasing commercial real estate. He's got a YouTube channel with over 117,000 views. He's grown his Instagram account, over 13,000 followers. And we're going to ask how we can get in touch with him when we talk about this. But this show, The Root of All Success, is all about success, finding out how people like Tyler created a successful company and is living a successful life. So welcome, me, help me welcome our guest today, Tyler Cobble. Tyler, good Jason, to see you. Yeah, excited to be here, man. And I couldn't have picked a better venue. This place is beautiful. Yeah. I love the standard. It is a fantastic club. I'm honored to be a member and it's so much fun to come here. I've got, as a matter of fact, tonight I've got a dinner here with some of my coaching clients and, and uh, I do meetups. I've got a bunch of people coming in from out of state and out of town next week and we're doing a dinner. So it's a, it's always a great time. So thank you for being here. And I didn't mention this, but we're both smoking cigars today. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it, but these are uh, Crown Head Cigars, which is a Nashville company. These are four kicks. And then we're also drinking some, uh, drinking some whiskey today. This is actually Guidance whiskey. So yeah. we're enjoying this and Guidance is a Nashville whiskey brand. So it is. It's all Nashville today, man. That's, that's another Jason that owns Guidance, too. That's right. His Jason Rigel. He actually was, has been a guest on my show. Oh, has he really? Mm -hmm. oh, Jason's a great guy. We've worked on a couple of deals together. And Jason's a good dude, and uh, his whiskey's also very good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So how long have you been in Nashville? Man, I'm actually from here. So I guess I'm uh, what everybody considers a unicorn uh, at this point. I don't really call myself a unicorn, but I uh, grew up in Nashville. And one of the rare few, the, the Nashville that I grew up in, man, night and day yep. different compared to what it is today. You know, it was a small, honestly, like sleepy little town. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it was never on anybody's radar, uh, which was always kind of cool growing up. You, you got this nice southern city. It was always a little more progressive, but it was quiet. It kind of shut down at 10 o'clock at night. And I am one of the few Nashvilleans. Uh, that I grew up with that loves what the city has become. I think that where Nashville is headed is it's in such a positive direction. I'll tell you this real quick. When I was in high school, I remember when Chipotle opened up uh -huh. in Nashville, and that was such a big deal. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even kidding. There was a line around the block when we got our first Chipotle. And it's funny to look back on that now because I feel like every quarter we've got a James Beard award-winning chef opening up some amazing concept here so it's it's funny how far we've come so what part of nashville did you grow up in grew up in forest hills which is right between green hills and brentwood uh, it's pretty small so a lot of people don't know where that is but yeah south side of nashville yeah well i'm also one of the unicorns i i lived over in east nashville as a kid learned to ride my bike over there on if you know where eastland is and oh yeah right over there i my, lived off of eastland yeah on set left was where my grandparents lived and my dad grew up in that house and uh, we lived there as a family. Uh, my mom and dad, my little brother and I lived there and they had a really big house and we had half the house to ourselves. And I learned how to ride, ride my bicycle over on Setliff as a kid. But we ended up moving to White House when I was a kid. But, but Nashville's really, I mean, I'm from here. My wife grew up here, so she lived in Northeast Nashville. We met on a blind date in high school and to, you know she went to a different high school with me, obviously. But, but uh, yeah, so it's not a lot of people we can sit across the table from and go, yeah, I grew up here. This is my no. town. No, there's so many people moving here, and especially after COVID. I mean, you thought a lot of people were moving to Nashville back in 2019. It's it's wild to see how many people are moving here now. Yeah, I think um, I don't live in a neighborhood anymore because I, I bought a new house three, about three and a half years ago. But the neighborhood I lived in before, most of the people in the neighborhood were not from Tennessee. Yeah. They were from Colorado, New York, Wyoming, California, Connecticut. I mean, it was, it's crazy. The guys, you know, the guys in the neighborhood would get together every once in a while at a coffee shop and have coffee. And it, like, I don't think anybody was from here. They're all from somewhere else, which is fine. That's cool. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm welcome, welcome them. Hey, that's how a city grows, right? <laughs> but I can remember back in, in uh, Second Avenue back in the days uh, when I was in high school and college hanging out on Second Avenue and the, uh, it, it was so much different than it is now. Well, but people, it's so people don't cool. know that now. You know, Second Avenue used to be Broadway. Like Broadway wasn't really a thing. There was no reason to go down to Broadway. You had a couple of bars down there, but Second Avenue is where all the bars were, and that, that was where you would go downtown. Yeah, was Broadway was sketchy. <laughs> yeah, Broadway was sketchy at the time yeah. back in the day, back in the '90s. I, I, I graduated high school in '93, so I'm I'm older than you, but I remember going down there in the early 90s in high school and college and hanging out there was a club called the underground oh yeah it's not there obviously it hadn't been there in years and we'd go to this i took my wife on her 16th birthday this is how long we've known each other 
to the spaghetti factory, which is now wow. with the bombing that happened last year. It's not open anymore, but there was this big, uh, big kind of a big black homeless guy who lived in his car on Second Avenue and got it and played his guitar. You remember? Do you remember who I'm no, talking about? No. So that he was like, I can't remember his name, but people who are listening to the show that are from Nashville. If you've been here a long time, I used to know the guy's name, but he was always sitting in front of the spaghetti factory playing his guitar, and he sang the song about a big-legged woman. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of his staple. But yeah, Nashville is such a cool city, And uh, but how did you, how did, how, why did commercial real estate become kind of the thing you wanted to focus on? What was the genesis of that in, intrigue? It's a great question, and it's kind of funny. You know, a lot of people struggle for years to try and break into commercial real estate, and I had it just thrown in my lap. Um, and it took me a couple of years to realize how lucky I was to be just getting into commercial real estate the way that I did. Um, but I, man, I, I got into sales right out of high school, did really well with that. And I was sitting in college one day, and I'll never forget it, I was taking a class in geology on pyroclastic flow. Thinking I don't about even know what that is. <laughs> it's, it's literally how uh, like volcanic fluids flow, right? Like after a volcano erupts. And I was sitting there to my, thinking to myself, you know, I learned all of this in eighth grade because I was fortunate enough to go to a very great high school. And, uh, well, MBA, uh, which is, that eighth grade is obviously not high school. But I learned all of that in eighth grade. I'm sitting here, I'm paying for the University of Tennessee, and I'm learning something I've already learned before. And I started running the math of how much money I made that summer, which was 30 grand in three months, which, you know, as a 19 year old kid, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money today. And uh, I annualized my income. I was like, man, I'd be making $120,000 a year doing sales if I wasn't sitting here in this college class right now. So I dropped out, finished my freshman year, re-enrolled my sophomore year, but ended up not going to any classes, and moved back to Nashville, and a local developer that I had sold to that previous summer offered me a job. He what were you selling? For him. Cutco knives. Cutco. Oh, Cutco I've got knives. some of those in my kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, man. My neighbor had sold to my mom back when I was in like middle school. And so I grew up using Cutco knives and loved them. And I heard he made 10 grand that summer selling those knives. I was like, well, I can do that. So came out and just crushed it. My daughter, my daughter, she's 19 and she started selling Cutco. I guess it was last year. Somebody, you know, you know how they do. They're oh, always yeah. recruiting new young they people to, to do it. Yeah. And that's how their model works. But she did it and actually sold, sold. Uh, we bought some there, all her friends and family all bought some, but she's like, I don't think sales is my thing. So she, she's not doing that anymore. Yeah. I think the average rep sells about two to $3,000 worth of knives. Um, and I sold about 220,000 wow. in 15 months. So you still got Cutco at the house? Oh, I've, I've got this giant <laughs> block set. And the, fun, the funniest thing is whenever I have friends over, they're like, we know you don't cook. You eat out for every meal. What is this here for? And now it's basically just a trophy of, of my past life. So sales was kind of the intro, entrance into this new opportunity for you. So you, college was there. That's kind of the normal track. How, how old are you? You're, you're I'm millennial. 29. 29 years old. So uh, you've become amazingly successful even at 20, uh, up to 29. But early teenage or late teenage years, early college years, early 20s, sales becomes this thing like, holy crap, I can make a lot of money doing this as opposed to getting a degree. Right. So you went to work for this developer that you'd sold cut code knives to. Yep. So what was the developer doing? Was it just real estate development, yep. commercial or residential? A little bit of everything, which is such a phenomenal experience. I mean, you know, if you get into commercial real estate, chances are, especially if you start off at a big brokerage, you know, they're going to say, hey, you're the office rep guy. All you do is lease office space, or you're the single tenant net lease investment sales guy. Like you only get, you get siloed and you have to focus on one thing, which makes sense for these giant companies, right? They want one person focused on one thing because they can be the best at sales in that particular arena. Well, I had a totally different upbringing in the, in the business. Instead of that, uh, the boutique development firm I worked for, they were doing office and retail, industrial, multifamily. We did townhomes. We did single family customs. So I got a taste for everything, which, which was such a great education uh, into the world of commercial real estate. So it's, it's helped me out quite a bit since. How long were you with that, the development company? 
was with them for about four and a half years. Oh, wow. So that's yeah. pretty good. So you started at, what, 19, 20 years old? Uh, right at 21. So 21, so you, up to 25, you sold $12 million worth of commercial real estate through that company, but you were frustrated about the inflexibility and lack of technology, innovation, and you went and started Cobble Group. So when did that start? That's right. So, yeah, so the first two years, basically, all I did was focus on leasing their portfolio. Uh, they had a shopping center, an office building downtown, and some industrial space, and that was pretty much all I did. Which you know, twelve million seems high to me. It's really super low, um, because I was focused on year three. I got into the development side of things, and so I started splitting my time, probably seventy thirty more on the development than I was on the brokerage, and put my first development deal together when I was twenty four, twenty five, which was forty two townhomes down in Bellevue. And I realized how much I just loved that whole process of going out and finding something, coming up with the idea from scratch, and then developing it and implementing it, and actually watch the fruits of your labor come out of the ground. It's really cool. I can see why people who work on farms and, and do very similar things, they get that, that gratification from it. Um, but it, we had some differences of opinion on how to run a business and, and what my growth track uh, trajectory was going to be. And I very quickly saw, okay, I'm gonna be seen as a project manager and a leasing agent, and that's it. And that wasn't where I wanted to be in my career. So I decided to leave. It was actually two weeks after I had launched my book. Um, I had never gotten support from the company for doing the book. Um, not that I needed it, but you'd think, hey, this could, be, this could bring us some business. This could be a good thing for everybody. Um, it became an Amazon bestseller in 48 hours which is really fast. And it was kind of a whirlwind after that. Within two weeks, I left and started my own firm. I just realized, you know what? I've got a personal brand now that I can actually start leaning into and creating. It's time for me to go do that. So talk. let's talk about the book, because I'm interested in that. So you're an employee, W2 employee, working for another company. You're killing it, all right? You're, you're to use that term, unicorn, you know, the, the people like us who are now our company owners, we want to find people like us, right. like you, to do what you do because, man, you're just that unicorn that does things in a unique and high level way. So you're killing it and you decide to write this book. What, why did you decide to write the book? So you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but my frustration with the commercial real estate industry is that it has, it's still stuck for the most part in the 1980s. Guys are sitting at desks, cold calling, and there's no marketing efforts. And so I had watched a bunch of my friends that were in residential do what they do online and with Facebook and Instagram and how they're marketing and they're sending flyers and mailers. And I always wondered, like, why don't people do that in commercial real estate? Why don't you go out and market in different ways? And I read this book called The Blue Ocean Strategy. Yep. And it's one of the number one books that I recommend to people because it helps you realize why... Am I gonna compete against everybody that's been in the business for 30 years? I'm gonna lose every time. Why would I compete against them when I can go find my own ocean and flourish? And what nobody had done in Nashville was write a book on commercial real estate. What nobody had done in Nashville was start an Instagram account showing the behind the scenes of commercial real estate in Nashville. Um, you know, and that, that became a, that's become a, a big theme in my entire career. Nobody focused on a neighborhood. So I became the East Nashville guy. Nobody focused on micro units, so we started focusing on micro units, and we found quite a bit of success in all of those different arenas because we're the only guys doing it, and we're kind of pushing the envelope in that respect. So that's what the book was for me. So it was, was an the, opportunity to get out there and, and market myself in a different way. Was the book uh, an ebook or was it an actual physical? No, I, I I had a publisher out of Austin, Texas. Really? So, oh yeah, it's a fully published book. So was it a digital download too, or just only uh, only a physical book? At order? that time, it was just a physical book. Um, since then, we now give the book away for free on my website. Right. Um, I went in and recorded it as an audio book myself. Oh, cool. Um, so it's available in Audible as well. And I, I was adamant about doing that myself because it's it's just such a great way to connect with your audience, right? They they get to know you a little bit better. They hear your uh, the, the way that you speak and and um, all of that stuff. So that that was a that was a very fun process. Well, for me. the recording for Audible, how long did that? That's a long reading a book. That's four or five hours. Of, it was. Least. It was. It was about four and a half hours of just sitting there and reading. And I kept. I would read it. 
you know, like section by section or chapter by chapter. And I'd have to get up and go walk around and take a break because, I mean, it's that's tough work, man. I mean, it's just it's like one, you're rereading something that you've already written. So you're like you're already in that zone of there's nothing new going on here uh-huh. and you're having to read out loud, but it was, it was a great process. Did you, uh, did you have to hold yourself back from ad libbing? Cause you read a sentence. You're like, yeah, but now I know more. I'm going to, I'm going to add stuff. Did you have to keep yourself from doing that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I had to, cause I didn't record the audio book until gosh, it must've been like March of 2020, the pandemic hit. And I was like, you know what? I've finally got time. I'm just going to go do this. Um, and so that's when we decided to do it. So you think of it, that was, you know, three years after I had initially launched the book. I know way more about leasing commercial real estate than I did then, but the entire intent behind the book was just to give kind of a surface level, like, Hey, here's how leasing works. Cause a lot of business owners have no idea, but, uh, I very quickly realized that if I was going to ad lib on this book, we're going to be here for 12 hours <laughs> and I'm just going to read through this thing and get it over with. I'm listening to it seems like for six months I've been listening to The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene on Audible. I don't know if you've ever read that no, book. No, I haven't, but I've heard of it. Oh, my gosh. It's like 15 hours of audio. It's such a long book, and it's it's a good book. I mean, there's parts of it I don't like, but it's a good book. But I can't imagine that the guy re- – I don't know. It's not Robert Greene reading it. I don't know who read it, but I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, it's yeah. so long. But I, congrats on the book, man. 48 hours bestseller. Uh, you got another book in you, you're going to write another one or is that just kind of one and done? You move on to something different. Yeah, we're actually working on the second one right now. I, I realized it was funny after I, the, the whole intent behind the book was to get more leasing clients. And as soon as I launched it, my career kind of got into a different spot where I was focusing more on sales. And I was like, well, great. This book doesn't really serve me anymore. It's it's wonderful that it's out there and it's and it does actually help people because um, people still reach out to me time and time again. And we actually had two clients move here from California last year that read the book and called me when they moved to Nashville. So we got to work with them and that was really cool. Um, but now we're writing a book on investing in commercial real estate, which is 99% of what I spend my time doing at this point. So we've actually been, uh, we're writing it in a very different way. I've broken it down essentially blog post by blog post. Um, and so once all of that is done, I'll hire an editor, we'll compile it and uh, we'll have the second book. So you've got so you got the Cobble Group, which is just you're selling real estate. That's right. But you've got your Parasol Property Management Group, which is managing real estate, and then Hamilton Development, that's doing you know you got like fifty million dollars for the project on the way right now. So uh, out of those three companies, which one are you spending most of your time? Yeah, I'd say it's it's definitely Hamilton at this point. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to find some amazing people who are totally bought into our vision and what we're trying to do. Uh, that are running uh, the Cobble Group and Parasol. So I work, it's pr- kind of cool actually, I get to work just in business development for both of those companies. So I'm trying to, it's, it's funny, you know, everybody always says work on the business, not in the business. I've gotten to a point where I've been able to work on the business so much, I kind of want to work in the business again. Uh, but I've gotten to where you know somebody else can kind of run everything and I get to come in and just do the one sliver that I'm really, really good at and better than anybody else and I don't have to focus on anything else. That's great. Which that, is wonderful. Well, and that's kind of the thing that I do every day as a, as a business coach is I my, my message is exit without exiting. How can you set your business up to run without you and you only get involved to the extent that you want to get involved? That's exactly right. And and I think you, you've done that. And at 29, I can't, you know, I didn't even have my first company until I was in my 30s. But but I, I think that what you've done is phenomenally um, it's impressive. It's impressive. And I didn't know you were 29. I mean, we've known each other for a couple of years, a few years but, yeah. but not really like we didn't really know each other. I was part of your uh, credit investor group or your advanced investment group at, through uh, real estate investors in Nashville. But uh, I didn't know you were 29. So that's even more impressive that you've accomplished so much before you're 30. It's funny. I try not to not to tell people because everybody just assumes I'm in my mid 30s, mid to late 30s, because, you know, I'm big dude, got a beard, deep voice, whatever. Um, and that's actually served me quite a bit because when I got into real estate, I knew how to sell, but I was 21, 22 and I could grow a beard. So I, as soon as I could, I grew it. <laughs> no one ever questioned like, Hey, do you know what you're doing? And I, cause I didn't need anybody doing that. I knew what I was doing. Um, so it's actually helped me out quite a bit. Well, I've got a funny story about that. I, I was, uh, so I started my comp, my, my first big company. I started when I was 34. Five, I think, 35 when I started my first big company and it turned into a multi-million dollar company and took me to the success I've been able to experience today. But I remember 
calling a hospital group. We did a lot of work in hospitals. And I remember sitting across from a dude one time pitching, and he, he said, and it was, he's very, it was very rude, he should never have done this, but his, his, here was his first question, how old are you? And he asked me that question. I, you know, I'm in my mid thirties. I mean, I'm beyond you asking me how old I am. I know yeah. I have a. If I didn't have a beard, I'd look like I'm twelve. I understand. <laughs> but I. So, but, but I. But he asked, "How old are you?" And I'm like, "Okay." I, so I answered the question, and he goes, and, and then we, then like his next question was, "How much revenue did you guys do last year?" And I looked at him and said, "Well, how much revenue did you do?" Like, <laughs> what? The, what I don't understand yeah. these questions, man. And he was the guy was really a jerk. Uh, shouldn't and we ended up doing business with him, but it took like three years to get that deal done. So wow. the, the 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 age discrimination is a real thing. I think that and and you were able to overcome that uh, through beards and deep voices. <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, it's it's funny. I had a I had a conversation with a guy earlier today who was in the exact same spot, and he was like twenty seven or twenty eight when he got into real estate. He was thirty one at the time that this was going on. That he got questioned on how old he was or how much experience he had in real estate. And he was like, I just looked him right in the eye and I said, you know what, I do 20 times the amount of volume that the average real estate agent does in one year. So I get 20 years of experience for every year that I've been in this business. That's a good response. And that's really tough to argue against. Yeah. So you're like, yeah, okay, that's right. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in a business. As long as you're out there working and you're gaining the experience and knowledge because you're doing better than everybody else, you're gaining far more experience than some people will in 10 years. Yeah, and then the real estate market, especially here in Nashville, I, I think that I think the last count I had heard was there are 15,000 realtors in the Nashville market. More than the more than listings. There is more there are more realtors, realtors than listings in Nashville. And that's mostly oh, residential, yeah. but you know, to, to, just because a person's 40 has nothing to do with their ability to, to know the market and sell your home or sell your commercial property or develop something. So I, I applaud you for being able to succeed in spite of that age discrimination. So uh, so you got you got Cobble Group, you got Parasol, which is property de, uh, property management, and you got Hamilton, which is development. Um, so Cobble Group is your name, right? Yep. So where's Par what's Parasol and Hamilton about? I'm just yeah. curious. No, absolutely. So. Uh, I realized after I started the Cobble Group that some people can sometimes have the wrong impression of a business name. I don't want anybody to think that I have some sort of ego where I've got to have my name on the door. The Cobble Group made sense because it was so built around my brand that, you know, it's easy and whatever. And, and you know, I'm from Nashville, people would recognize the name, it helps. When you get into property management, it doesn't matter how outstanding of a property management firm you are, you're going to get bad reviews. People are going to be upset with you for one reason or another. I mean, we had one tenant that you know they they were on a month to month lease, and per the lease, we only had to give them thirty days notice uh, that they had to leave, and we ended up giving them sixty because we were just being kind and you know being like, hey, we want to give you enough time to get out, get your things, because it, they were occupying two hundred square feet and we had an eight thousand square foot tenant coming in, and so the property management firm had to uh, had to notify them. And they were furious. They were like, I've been here for years. I can't believe y'all would give me such short notice, which again was way longer than contractually we had to. But you know, she went and reported us to Codes for building up the space, which the Codes came through the building. They inspected it. They said, yeah, everything's fine. But it's, it's stuff like that, that you have to deal with that I just didn't want my personal name tied to it. If you look up Parasol, you're going to find me. Right. It's going to be all over it. But I didn't want somebody to search Tyler Cobble and then you know, management comes up and we have a one-star review because of something that was entirely not our fault. Yeah. Um, so parasol is another word for an umbrella. Right. And so getting into property management, we wanted our we wanted a symbol to show that we've got you covered. And so that's, that's pretty cool. Much what I kind of thought that's probably what it meant because uh, I knew what a parasol is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about Hamilton? Hamilton is actually uh, it's a family name. Uh, it's my middle name. It was my grandmother's maiden name. And it, uh, to me, it was something that I could name a company after that no one would necessarily know that it ties back to my family. Uh, but it also just kind of sounds a little ritzy, yeah. Uh, which is not me at all. But for a development <laughs> firm, it's kind of you know Hamilton. Like it's just it's there. Yeah. So that's that's why we decided to do that. So you you have achieved a lot of success in your first twenty nine years, three decades on the planet. 
So how would you define, because this is the root of all success, by, you know, as the show is called, but so how would you define success? Like, what does that, what do you think that means? It's so funny. If you had asked me that 10 years ago, I'd be like, make it a million dollars a year. Yeah. Or, you know, $100,000 a month in passive income. And it's funny how that just starts to evolve because everybody has a completely different de definition of what success is. You know, success for some people could just be making sure that their family's taken care of, and that's it. And success for other people could be getting a Lamborghini. To me, you know, success is just being proud of what I do every day and happy to go to work. And I, I use the term work very lightly. Yeah. Because I, I don't feel like I have a job. I mean, I, it's, it, I feel like I have this hobby that happens to be investing in developing commercial real estate, and it's so much fun to get to do every day. I mean, we get to shape a city or shape a neighborhood, yeah. change how people interact with the built environment. And, and that's something that I can wake up and be proud of every day. So with that in mind, do you consider yourself a successful person? Absolutely. Abs in, in that term of the, of the word, absolutely. I've been successful for years. Yeah, I love the confidence in that because I think that you can't find a successful person who's not confident. They're all confident. Confidence and success go together. If you're, if you're, you know, if you lack confidence and lack that self awareness and, and self confidence, you're not going to achieve success. So I think one of the one of the ways you achieve success is by being confident. But I found, and I talk about this a lot on the show, and I want to kind of go through this with you because I, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, I'm impressed with you even more now that we got to sit down and talk because we've never been able to do this. Well, thank but, you. Yeah. but I think that in my in my story, I've had you know I was an unemployed school teacher when I started my first company, yeah. and you know and I've I went from unemployed school teacher to millionaire and and think life is so much different than it was before, uh, and I don't know that it's any. Uh, bet, better is a weird word, but I've had more options right now than I did before, and that's great. But I think. In terms of what I've been able to discover uh, over these last 10 years or so, building a company to multi-million dollar status, being on Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine, you've also been recognized in National Business Journal. It's one of the top 25, one of the top commercial real estate companies. So you've you've got the awards too. But what I've found is that when I have a cigar with somebody or have a glass of bourbon or have dinner, and I ask them, "Why? Well, how did you get so successful?" I find there's five things that happen in everybody's story, whether they recognize it or not. And I, 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 I didn't originally know that, it just was kind of discovered. And so I wanna see if they play out in your story. So the first one, the first key to success that I found in people like you is, is passion. And, and, and I mean, like I'm, I'm listening to, I was listening to a book on the way, on the drive down here today. It was actually Blinkist. I use Blinkist. Okay, I yeah. I don't know if you, are you familiar with Blinkist? Yeah, I've used I love it before. It. I, love, I it. love it. I need to put it in the show notes, my, my link to that, because it's like every nonfiction book reduced to 20 minutes and it's fantastic. Or less. Or less. And then yeah. you can, if you like it, then you go get the other one. But anyway, I was listening to a book and, and it was on success, uncommon success. And, and his key was passion, but he uses the emotional side of passion more than the uh, mental. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna distinguish that and then I'm gonna ask you about it. So the emotional side of passion is you love it, you're excited about it, and I can sense that in you about real estate. I mean, you, you are obviously, at least to me, passionate about real estate. But the other side of, of, of passion is this mental where you're willing to endure. That's actually what the word means. If you go back and look at the word passion, it comes from the root word means willing to endure. So it's not as much joy and excitement and love as it is willing to endure or suffer even. And I find that most, well, every successful entrepreneur, if they didn't have the willingness to endure for the thing they're building, they would have never achieved it. So how does that passion, that mental side of passion, the willingness to endure, how's that played into your story of being successful? Yeah, that's, that's uh, I've never been asked that before, so I love that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Commercial real estate is known for having some of the biggest egos in the world, right? It's almost like investment banking. There's just some guys that once they get to the top, they have the biggest egos. I mean, Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can look at him. Yeah. I mean, guy's got an ego. Regardless of your opinion on him, he's got an ego. Yep. And he's a commercial real estate developer. And that that's kind of the, the like, I don't know, par for the course, it seems like, when it comes to commercial real estate development. I, I've never really had that. 
I mean, I, I enjoy, I put my name on stuff because I'm proud of it. And I think that it's something that, you know, I want my kids to drive by one day and be proud of everything that I've done. Um, you know, I, I reinvest almost everything back into my companies and back into real estate. You know, I, I drive a Tesla. It's a, that was a $57,000 purchase. That's the biggest personal purchase I've ever made. And I struggled with it, but it was because my BMW that I had been driving since 2007, uh, a couple of years ago, finally got to the point where the, the, the repairman was like, it's going to cost you $3,500 to repair this. And that <laughs> car was not worth near that. So, you know, even that purchase I struggled with because, you know, to me, that was more money, more funds that I could reinvest into the company. I rent a room from a buddy of mine in his four bedroom house for $850 a month. I don't live lavishly and that allows me to continue to reinvest into my mission, which to me is so much more important than getting a sports car or being flashy and having a condo downtown or whatever that is. Um, not that there's anything wrong with any of that. And look, at some point I will have a Ferrari, right? Like. I've always wanted a red Ferrari with a tan interior. To me, there's just something so classic about that. But I haven't earned that yet. I mean, that's going to that's gonna come in the next 10 years, right? So right now, I'm laying the foundation. So that's kind of my mentality when I, when I get up every day. And so you're just willing to wait for that stuff. You're willing to endure the hard building of Parasol and Hamilton and Cobble Group to get to that point where the Ferrari is an earned earned uh, luxury rather than a forced luxury right now. That's right. It, to me, it's so tough to invest in non-appreciating assets, right? I mean, you look at like, oh, let's use sports. Oh, let's pick on cars. You know, there are so many people that I know, younger guys, my age, they get into real estate, they make six figures in, in a year and they go out and buy this luxury car. You've got to now pay to maintain that thing. And instead of you know, having a piece of real estate that starts adding into that monthly passive income and appreciating to a point where, you know, in five years, I mean, really, I could take off right now and be gone for the next three months and I'm fine. I don't have to worry about a thing. My team's going to keep running. I'm going to keep making money. We're good. But instead of investing for that so that that amount of money is so much to where you can really just not worry about anything, you're buying a sports car. You're trying to impress other people. Like I, to me, flexibility in my life is paramount to impressing people that I don't even care about. Yeah. You know? So again, at some point I will buy that Ferrari for myself, but right now I'm building and laying the foundation. You know, they're building a Ferrari dealership here in Nashville. I, I know. I'm, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Super excited. You got to go it. down there and check one out. I man. will. I will. I mean, seriously, it's going to become like a monthly thing. I'm going to go down there and shop, but I'm never going to buy. Well, it's my, one of my friends, uh, uh, he actually lives down the street from me. He he is a he's a huge Ferrari guy, and and he I've had the pleasure of riding in his Ferrari a few times, and it is it is it is pretty cool. And he just, he's actually get it just uh, ordered a new one, and it's coming in I think here in the next few months. But but uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I love cars. I'm a motorcycle guy actually. Okay. I love motorcycles more than I like cars. But but uh, but I like them so much that I've accelerated my buying of cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But see, some people but don't. You, but you've earned it, right? Yeah. Like you've put in, you've put in a few more years than I have. Yeah. And 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 you're in a totally different point. Like, dude, five years, I'm going to be at that point. There you go. You well, know? you you got you achieved it much quicker than I did because I was I was in ministry in my twenties um, and sales too. I sold insurance to kind of make make some money, but I was in ministry for 13 years and then I taught school for four years and then I became an entrepreneur at 30, like I said, 35 and I'm 46 now. So I, I, I look back and think, holy crap, if I was 21, 25 years old, like you are when you started knowing what I know now and got into real estate, I, I tell people this and I truly believe it. I think if I know, if I could go back in time and start with what I know now, and not invest in Dogecoin and that crap. Like, yeah. But like, if I could go back in time and take what I know now, I'd be a billionaire. I, I really think that that understanding how money works is the financial literacy is such a financial illiteracy is such a problem in our society. And entrepreneurship is. Um, is a is a way out of that, but it's not a guarantee. There's so many entrepreneurs that still are living essentially paycheck to paycheck. They're they're slaves to their jobs. They're not their own bosses. They're their own employees. And that's part of my mission is to help them, help them become their own boss and actually be the owner investor rather than the owner operator. 
Yeah, I mean, there's almost this sense of entitlement that you have to get over, right? I mean, you watch Shark Tank, and there there have been a few pitches on Shark Tank where the the entrepreneur comes in, pitches the sharks, and then the sharks go, okay, what is the money going to be used for? And they're like, well, it's going to be to put me on salary so I don't have to worry about anything anymore. And the sharks are all, like, they almost always back out. Because if you don't have the conviction that your business or your mission, your values, if you don't have the conviction that you're going to be able to pull it off and you're willing to sacrifice now for what's going to come later, why would somebody else believe in you either? Yeah. Well, and that's, that goes back to the passion. You know, are you willing to endure? I mean, I know that when you started, you started as a W-2 employee and sold a lot of real estate. But when you started Cobble Group, I imagine that that income probably went down for a while and you suffered through, endured through, and now, now you can take three months off and be fine. The funny thing is my income tripled. <laughs> that year oh, that well, I, I was wrong. So I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a very rare case, um, but I, I had be, I had built up this business and I realized I was being stifled. I wasn't able to go market and brand and do the stuff that I wanted to. The only thing that I lost was the security, right? Like now I had to go out and like, man, it's really sink or swim. If I don't go out and catch that gazelle today, I'm not eating tonight. So uh, that that was the big shift for me, but it paid off. But I'm telling you, I, I'm going to challenge you on the security thing. Cause I, and, and now, now I think you would probably agree with me if I explain this, but m- people think that a job, a W2 job is more secure than entrepreneurship. And it isn't Not at all. And, and it's so weird how we perceive this. And I'll give you an example. <laughs> so I, I, I have, I own eight companies and I have employees and I've got employees who go and buy houses, they get mortgages, they refinance and do all that, where I try to go do it and my banker's like, yeah, you, you're you're showing a negative income. Well, it's because I'm smart. It's not because I'm yeah. not making any money. And I Let's can't- Let's peel these tax returns yeah. back a little bit. So I can't, I, like there are times where I couldn't refinance because of the way my tax returns, but then I've got an employee who can. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. They think they're secure, but the deal is I could walk in at any moment and say you're fired or I could, or the, or the business could tank and I can't afford to keep them on, on staff, where the security of being an entrepreneur is much higher than being the W-2 employee. I, I totally agree with you now. I mean, ba- back then, you know, when you first start, you're oh, like, yeah. oh, man, I don't know. You know, you know I mean, I've, I've always had a fair amount of confidence in myself. Not, again, not an ego or not overconfidence by any mean, but I've always believed that I'm the best horse to bet on. And I still to that day, I am the best horse that I could ever bet on. Um, but, you know, employees don't necessarily realize that yeah, I mean they they could be fired the next day, or the business could take a dump. The business I mean, could tank. I, I mean, look at look at uh, like what happened with Instagram and Facebook yesterday. If your business was a hundred percent dependent upon Facebook and Instagram, you're you're out. Yeah, right. It was shut down for eight hours or whatever it was. I mean, that was really weird too, was wasn't wild. it? No, that no, that was a hu- I think we're going to find out that that was a huge cyber attack. Uh, well, I don't know, and that whistleblower just came out too, so I don't know. I, I, I tend the conspiracy theorist in me thinks that that probably had something to do with it, but who knows? Well, the second the second key to success not only is passion, but I found that entrepreneurs like you who become successful have a place that they can point to, place and time. Like I was at the right place at the right time because this happened. So can you look back in your story and go, yeah, this this is a place and time? And I would I'll seed. The, your possible answer to this by saying, I don't know how you found Cutco, but whatever that was, yeah. probably was the right place in time where you're like, oh, I didn't know I could make $30,000 in three months as a, as a teenager. I had no idea. I mean, you know, I always, uh, I was always the kid that was comfortable being around adults and I was fine having conversations with people that were older than I was and, and I could speak intelligently instead of, you know, keeping my eyes down or not trying to talk or whatever. I, I, I get that from my dad. He was a natural salesman as well. And 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 let's uh, let's frame sales as relationship building, right? Because a lot of people get into the wrong mentality when it comes to sales of like, I just need to convince you to buy something whether it's good for you or not. Sales is relationship building and working through and showing people what they may not know that they need. And so that was that was absolutely what it was. It was that summer I was working for Cutco and I realized, wow, I have no problem sitting down talking to people and walking them through, whether it's, hey, honestly, the only thing for you, Mrs. Jones, that you need out of here is this $50 knife, to, you know, you love cooking, you need this $1,500 knife set. And I would always kind of guide people 
to what they needed instead of just trying to push something on somebody. And so it was always just so, it came so naturally to me. I couldn't believe it. How did you find out about Cutco? Where were you on that? Yeah, so my, um, my our neighbor sold my mom Cutco then, that uh, one summer when I was in middle school, so grew up with it. And I was best friends with his little brother. So I always heard about how much money he made in Cutco. I was like, man, that's so amazing that you know he could just come out and do that. And so that summer when I turned, uh, when I, turned uh, well, I was 18 going into the summer, I was actually selling knives on my birthday. Um, and I, I just looked him up. I was like, you know what? I've worked construction for my grandfather every year. I was always the, the demo guy. Right, they would just give me a sledgehammer. I was big enough because of football that I would just go in and I would tear everything out. I didn't have any skills, right, because I just wasn't old enough. But I could do that, and I worked hard, and I was probably my grandfather's best employee. And I decided that summer, I was like, you know what, I do not want to do construction anymore. I'm tired of it. Let's let's go give this Cutco thing a shot. And um, I dedicated myself to it. I was the first one in the office every day. I was the last one to leave. And uh, I broke every sales record I could get my hands on. Man, how long did you sell Coco? 15 months. So I sold that summer, went to UT, sold that December when I came back into town, went back to school, then sold a second summer. That was it. That was it. Just you needed the taste of what success and money look like to take you to that next level. Who are, who are the people that you can point to? Because I also find that it's not only passion, being in the right place, right time, but it's also knowing the right people. Oh yeah. Who are the people in your life that you can point to? Like if I hadn't have known that person or been introduced to this person, I might not be the successful person I am today. Yeah, like my grandfather, number one, right? He, he instilled a, uh, a work ethic in me or maybe not even instilled, but fostered, right? Because it's so easy for a 12 year old kid to spend all summer playing in the woods and playing video games. But it was very important to them early on that it's like, no, you're gonna go work, you know, and I had the choice, right? But I wanted to go work for my grandfather. And so he was like, every summer, he's like, okay, come on, I'll put you to work, I'll give you something, I'll pay you $12 an hour. You know, as a 12 year old kid making $12 an hour, I had buddies making $7 an hour at Smoothie King. I was like, yeah, all right, suckers, I'm gonna really win. I'm like, man, I'm gonna make almost twice as much as these guys will this summer. Uh, and he always gave me more of a raise than I probably needed just because I was his, <laughs> his you know, grandson. And so by the time that I got to 17, I was making $20 an hour, wow. which I, that's a lot of money, man. Yeah, um, 20 bucks an hour, what is that? That's almost 50 grand a year, 40, yeah, 40 hours a week. 800 bucks a week. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it wasn't, it was never enough to where I had to pay taxes on it, which was awesome. Um, but you know, that's, it's hard work, man. I mean, being up on roofs and being in, in houses that don't have air conditioning. And, you know, again, I was one of the bigger guys. So I'm, I'm the one carrying all the heavy stuff in and out of these houses. And so, yeah, I just, I decided one summer, I was like, you know what? I would love to go. I mean, I, I spent a whole bunch of time with my grandfather that summer. Um, and I still do, but, uh, I was like, you know what? I want to go give, give something else a shot. So the fourth key to success that I found, so you got passion, be in the right place, right time, knowing the right people. It, the fourth one is preparation. And preparation is having the know-how to pull it off. Like how, you, how are you prepared? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that your preparation for that was obviously selling Cutco. You learn how to sell. And that, that ability, that's a skill that can make you more money than anything in the world, I believe. I believe sales is the thing. But that, that was part of your preparation. But I think also going to work for that boutique realty group that you went to work for prepared you for this success, is that the way you see it? It absolutely did. I mean, you know, look, I, I got the confidence that I knew what I was, that I could do it um, from Cutco, right? Because I'd never ever cold called. I'd never gone uh, and met with somebody and sat down and sold them anything. Yeah. So the the training and the experience that I got out of Cutco was phenomenal. And then going into real estate, I was like, well, I know I can talk to people. I may not know anything about commercial real estate at all because you take the licensing test and it's all residential. I knew nothing about commercial. But what I did know was that I can go knock on doors and cold call until my ears bleed and I'll figure it out. And that's, that's basically what I did. I spent the first two years just cold calling and knocking on doors, trying and to it, figure out what I was doing. And it worked. It worked really well. Lots of zeros. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I knew that, you know, even though I dropped out of college, I've always been big on education. And so I've always read, I've always listened to 
audiobooks. I've always listened to podcasts. I mean, I remember walking around a property, you know, every weekend, just listening to a new podcast and just trying to learn about commercial real estate, walking the property and looking at things. And, uh, you know, part of that was sitting in on every meeting that the company would allow me to sit in on so I could learn about it. And so I got to sit in on the weekly development meetings with the developers and the, the project managers and whoever they were meeting with, whether it was the bank or the architect or whoever that week. And so I learned how to put a development deal together. And you can't read about how to do real estate development. You can't listen to a podcast. You can't listen to an audiobook. It's kind of like that in life, right? Like you can get a general idea, but there's no one book that's going to teach you how to become a successful business owner. You'll get some ideas, but until you actually go out and do it, you're not going to really learn anything. Yeah. It's like learning how to fly a plane. I don't fly planes, but I can imagine it's the same thing. You know, you can go to school, go to classes, read the books, but until you get behind the cock in the cockpit, behind those gears and levers, and like you don't know how to do it. So Doesn't same matter. thing. Same yeah. thing with entrepreneurship. You've got to go do it. And and I, am, I'm so grateful for listeners of this show because it is a, it is that launching point for a lot of people. They're they they just want to hear people's story like you about how do they do it. Well, until you go do it, man, like this is great, but you got to get out there and act. Yeah, this is why you're listening to the show, right? You, you got to hear these kinds of things enough times to where you're like, you know what? There is no next podcast. I'm going to keep listening to the podcast. I, I'm still an avid listener. I was listening to one on the way over here. I still listen to all of that stuff to gain from it. But eventually, you just got to take action. Yeah. So the fifth, the fifth P is plan. So you got, they're all P's by the way, it's passion, place, people, preparation, plan. And plan is the financial, it has to do with finances. So a lot of entrepreneurs want to know, well, how do I, how do I succeed? Well, one of the success points, entry points to unlock success is you got to have the, uh, the, the ability to deploy the financial resources that you're going to need to be successful. And in commercial real estate, that is a big thing. I mean, development is not a, is not an inexpensive thing. I mean, to That's buy right. a piece of land, to hire the contractors, to make sure the codes are all right, you know, the design is cool and good. Uh, so how did you, when you started any of your companies, Callable Group, Par Parasol Property Management, or Hamilton Development, how did you finance those? What was your plan to finance that so that you could, what was your plan? How did you do that? Yeah, so the Cobble Group was very easy, right? I mean, I was a real estate broker already. Um, I paid a buddy of mine 50 bucks for a logo and we're kind of off to the races. That was the, the great thing about starting a brokerage is I knew that it's sales and so it's as much time and effort as I'm willing to put into it on the front end. So I didn't have this big check I had to write. I didn't need an investor. It was, okay, let's go close a deal and then we'll use that money to close the next deal and then we'll use that money to help close two more deals and then it just kind of compounds. The, you know, and that kind of instilled in me, you know, the, the less that I live off of, the more that I have to build this. And uh, that was kind of my mentality for the call group. It, it ended up being the same for Parasol. So whenever we would close a deal with a client that was buying a shopping center, we would just take over the property management for now. And so the call group kind of led into the property management. And then that even carried over into my first office investment, which... I didn't have any money. I was just a commercial real estate broker, but I knew what I wanted to get into. So I was just resourceful. I, I knew that if I put the property under contract, I could get a 3% commission. I knew I needed $100,000. So I called, two, this was five years in the business. I called two guys that I knew were making tons of money. They'd known me for years. And I said, look, here's my plan. You know how I work. I'm going to do this. I will, I will die on this, this, uh, this hill to make sure this project is successful because this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Will you invest in me? And so they put up the capital for me to go do the first project. And so that's kind of how I've always run it. And I mean, that was, you know, two years ago, it was a $575,000 building. I started off small. Uh, you know, now we're, we're buying a 1.6 million square foot property out in Chattanooga. So it, it all just compounds. Um, and you know, I've always worked to reinvest as much back into myself and the company as I as I possibly can. Yeah, you got a lot of discipline for somebody your age. I don't know how. I, I'm very fortunate that uh, that I have the mentality that I do. I've, it's it's weird getting to this point because I do like most of my friends are in their mid to late thirties um, because they're all in a very similar walk of life. The friends that I grew up with, and this was kind of depressing for me for a while. I couldn't, I got to a point very early on in my twenties, mid twenties, 
I couldn't relate to them anymore. You know, here I am trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay my assistant's paycheck next week because we haven't closed a deal in three months and I'm out here busting my ass, but I don't know where that next check's gonna come from. And they're all, you know, complaining about their boss and waiting to go party on the weekends. I was like, man, we are on such different wavelengths. Like, I love you as a friend. I can't, I don't have the headspace for this anymore. Isn't that funny, though? I mean, of course, your life is a little different than mine because, you I mean, you started pretty early in your entrepreneurial career. But the friends that I have had growing, growing up and then the friend, even as adults, some of the friends that I've had, like, my life has changed so much. And the things that I think about, my worldview and the the way that I live and understand how life works and how money works is so different. You know, you just kind of drift from some of those people and not, there's no value difference. I mean, they're still a valuable human like I am, but we see things so differently. You just kind of have to move to a different circle because you're operating on a different level. Yeah, and I struggled with that for a while. Me too. You know, I mean, it's, uh, look, being, owning a business and being an entrepreneur is a lonely venture. Uh, you know, they say it's lonely at the top, but you eventually find the people that like this. I mean, these kinds of conversations are so empowering for me. Like I get so much energy out of this and I love it. And so you find, you find new people to surround yourself with and you'll never forget your old friends. And for years I wondered like, man, is there something wrong with me? Like, why do I not enjoy going out and party with everybody? And why do I not enjoy this and that? And you know, going on vacations and stuff because I'm just so passionate about what I do. Like it's hard for me to go on vacation because I want to be here working. Um, you know, and that's something that I'm, I'm trying to be more intentional about, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, you start to com compartmentalize friends, right? So like whenever I want to just go out and have fun and talk about high school and stuff like that, like those are of course that my boys and we're going to go out and, you know, I'm, I've got one of my best friends from high school. He's getting married next year. So we're going to on a bachelor trip in, in December and I can't wait for that. Right, because it's like intentional time where I'm going to try and unplug from the business and just be like a kid again, uh -huh. basically. Uh, but the majority of my time is is spent having conversations like this because it just this is what helps you get to the next level, and that's really what I want out of life. Yeah, I, I can remember back in my 20s thinking about um, you know just for, for even just from a spiritual perspective what I what I was learning as a follower of Jesus and how I was growing in that. And I remember at times thinking, man, is it going to get any better? This is so great. And then now I'm 20 years beyond that. I'm going, okay, it's a lot different now. <laughs> There's so much more to do and learn and, and grow into. And I think that's, that's what's so intriguing and cool about entrepreneurship for me is that um, entrepreneurs are such a rare breed. There's lots of business owners, but I think entrepreneurs are, are unique. And I think that you, you, just because you own a business doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. You're not taking the risk. You're not innovating. And I, I love what you're doing. I'm very impressed with your story. And I'm honored that you, you, you came on to the show because just watching you from afar, I'm like, okay, this dude, this dude's legit. He's, he's succeeded, but to get to know your story today has been, it's been an honor, man. So let me ask you this kind of in closing. If in, on listening to this show, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, there's a lot of business owners, there's a lot of W2 employees. But if you were going to speak to one of those people that hasn't yet started, they haven't, got, they want to, but they haven't done it yet. What would what would your piece of advice be to that person right now? Just do it. Uh, it's it's so simple. I mean, you know, I'm going to rip off Nike on that one, but just get out there and do it. You know, entrepreneurs jump off cliffs and then build a plane, and you you got to just jump off the cliff and think that you're the best horse to bet on, that you're going to figure it out. I, I didn't start the brokerage until I was basically pushed into a corner where I was like, either I'm going to do this or I'm going to accept being somebody else's employee for the rest of my life. Yeah. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's I knew that that wasn't what I wanted for myself. I didn't buy my first building until two clients backed out. I was like, man, this is a $15,000 commission. I've got to make this money. And so I said, you know what, assign the contract to me and I'll do it. And then that year I bought three more buildings after that. So you just got to do it and find a way to pull it off. That's great, man. Well, it's good advice. And it's, it's very similar to a lot of the guests on the show that you got to take action. You, we said that at the beginning when we were talking, you just got to take action. If you don't take action, all the theory in the world, listen to the podcast, reading books, like what you wrote a book. I mean, reading those are great, but if you don't do anything with it, you know, like in my coaching clients, I talk all the time and say, listen, sitting through my coaching sessions is great, but the magic is in the action. Yeah. You got to go do it. Like I, I run a cohort 
uh, called the Exit Accelerator, which I'll talk about as we close out today. But when I when I do this, when I'm meeting with them, I say, listen, I'm giving you information and tools, but the magic is in the action. You've got to do the homework. And I give them homework. There's usually a couple hours with homework between sessions. You got to go do this because this is where it's going to happen. And the and the and the clients that I've got that actually take action are the ones that succeed. They're the ones that go. And there's a few clients who don't, and that's fine. I mean, everybody's their own person, but man, you got to take action. So I appreciate that yeah. advice. Anything else you want to leave us with or like pieces of wisdom or any, anything from your life and yeah. experience? I mean, I think that that's so true. Like I, ideas are worthless. Implementation is everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times have you been in, you know, I mean, I come up with all my ideas in the shower. I'm sure tons of people do too, because it's just time where you're by yourself thinking, how many ideas have you come up with in the shower that like a year later, you're like, man, I had that idea. That guy took it uh-huh. it's because somebody had the same idea and probably thousands of other people have that exact same idea, but that person decided to take action on it. You can have the best coaches, the best idea, the best business plan, the best marketing. It doesn't mean a thing if you're not out there and taking action on it. Well, that's great, man. Well, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So, uh, I'm big on YouTube right now. Um, We've, uh, it's funny, I, we wrote that bio two months ago. We're already over 200,000 views on YouTube now. So it's it's snowballing. I'm teaching people how to invest in commercial real estate. And I'm obviously very passionate about that, I love it. So, uh, so go check us out on YouTube, it's just under my name, Tyler Cobble. If you wanna actually get in touch with me, Instagram is by far the best way to do it. Uh, just commercial in Nashville with underscores between the words or search Tyler Cobble and find commercial in Nashville. Um, I respond to every DM on there. So. And it's T-Y-L-E-R-C-A-U-B-L-E. Yep. B-L-E. Cobble, C-A-U-B-L-E. All right. Well, Tyler, it's been an honor, man, to, to drink a little Nashville whiskey, smoke a little Nashville cigar, talk about Nashville and your success. So thank you so much for being here. Jason, the honor's mine. Thanks for having me, man. Well, um, so guys, as you listen to this show, as you think about the things that Tyler shared about his, his journey to success as a, as a real estate uh, mogul here in the Nashville market, the story is all, all the details are different, right? His details are different than yours, mine, everybody's, but the keys to success are going to be these things. So you can unlock your success by using the same keys. The door has the same lock. It's just the keys have to have to work and it's passion, right place, right time, knowing the right people, preparation and plan. And so if you think about those five things and how it's playing into your story as an entrepreneur, I, I, I guarantee you, you just pay attention to how those five things are, are flowing through your life and you will be successful too. Now, one of the things that I do as a business coach is I've got a group called the Exit Accelerator and it's a, it's a group coaching cohort that I take 12 entrepreneurs at a time through 12 weeks of learning the four steps to exit without exiting, which is one of the things that I did with one of my companies. I I built a multi-million dollar company and decided, hey, this this is great, but how can I live in such a way that I don't have to run this company every day and I can go do other things. And I've I've since since I exited that company without selling it to a third party, I've been able to live what we refer to as the exit lifestyle, where I can travel one week a month, which I do. Like I was last week on a motorcycle trip with friends for a whole week and I can I can go do things with my wife. I can start other companies, which I've started seven other companies since I exited. And it's being able to do that is what I live for. So what do you want to live for? What is it you want to do? And if you're interested in the Exit Accelerator, you can go to exitwithoutexiting.com and there's a little video in there that shows you what this is, this group coaching cohort is about and you can enroll. I've got one that's coming up very soon. Uh, you can start it. We meet on Thursdays for one hour. We meet eight times over 12 weeks and I will give you the four steps and all the tricks and tips that I learned to exit without exiting. So if you're interested in that, go to exit without exiting.com. And also, as we talked about with Tyler, make sure you go look him up on Instagram and YouTube. He's got some amazing content out there. So if you're interested in real estate, like I am, I have one of my companies, a real estate investing company, is I wanna go learn from people like him because he's been much more successful in real estate than I have been. So I wanna learn from people who are further down the road than me. So make sure you go follow Tyler on YouTube and Instagram. And thank you for tuning in for this show, The Root of All Success here at The Standard in Nashville. Tune in again next week when we meet with yet another successful uh, entrepreneur and talk about his or her journey to becoming the successful person they are. I'm the real Jason Duncan, and Jesus is King. 
Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.